So I just want to talk a little bit more about uh, this bonding between nonpolar molecules, uh, sorry, polar molecules, but uh, in particular what's called hydrogen bonding. Now I've, I've kind of touched on this already. Now there's a whole stack of notes here. I'm not going to read through these. You guys can do that at your leisure. But I just want to point this out to you. It's very important. If you have a look at, for example, water here, I've kind of showed you this idea with hydrogen fluoride, but as you know, water um, has oxygen in it, which is pulling electrons that way away from the hydrogen. So we've got this delta minus, delta plus thing going on. Here's another water molecule here. Here's delta minus, delta plus. And of course, you get this attraction between this molecule and this molecule via these two atoms here. And that bond there is, is given a special name. It's called the hydrogen bond. Um, in other words, the attraction here is relatively strong. It's nowhere near as strong as ionic bonds uh, and nowhere near as strong as covalent bonds, but it is strong and it makes these molecules sticky. Why are they particularly called hydrogen bonds? The reason for that is because hydrogen is a very small atom. Um, so when electrons get pulled away from it, it ends up with quite a deal of uh, positive charge here because it only had one or two electrons to start with. These hydrogen bonds only occur when you're considering elements that are very electronegative. And as I said, the three most electronegative elements in the periodic table are nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So you can only get hydrogen bonds with those particular types of compounds. So water, then, is actually quite a sticky molecule. It likes to stick to itself, and it accounts for the fact that water is actually a liquid at room temperature. Um, it also accounts for a number of other things. So, for example, as you probably know, water forms a film on top of it called a meniscus, and that's due to those water molecules actually pulling in on one another with those relatively strong hydrogen bonds. Having said that, these hydrogen bonds here are weak enough that you can break them apart and hence you can go swimming in the stuff. It's a liquid. Uh, you can pull the hydrogen bonds apart but then they'll quickly reform again. Okay, there's just a couple of other notes for you. I'm just, by the way, you know, dot points like this are just reinforcing what I've already covered. The fact that it's the bonds themselves are polar and it's the bent water molecule that re results in the whole molecule itself being polar is an extremely important thing to understand. Alright, so as I said, high, um, water molecules are particularly sticky um, and uh, that's due to this hydrogen bonding arrangement. Um, that means, of course, that the uh, the boiling points and melting points of these compounds that are joined by hydrogen bonds tend to be much more elevated than what you would normally expect. And here's a graph showing this. Uh, this is just dealing with boiling points here. And we've got three molecules here, all of which can hydrogen bond because they satisfy the, the two criteria. One is that they have hydrogen, the other one is that they've got an element out of those three, the nitrogen, the oxygen and the fluorine. If you can see here, their boiling points are very much elevated in comparison to other sorts of compounds. As I pointed out, that stickiness of water molecules then gives rise to this thing we call a meniscus, that thin film of water on uh, thin film on top of water, so much so that it can even support the weight of some organisms. So for example, this insect here. Um, now, there's another way in which water uh, sorry, there's another way in which molecules can uh, attract one another, and it's got nothing to do with these permanent kind of dipole arrangements that I've been talking about. What can happen is they can be joined by temporary uh, dipoles. Let me illustrate this by actually drawing it out for you. If I take, um, if I look at a molecule like nitrogen. I'll draw the three bonds in it, like this. Now because of course 
they are the same atom there, essentially. Um, well, they belong to the same element. They're different atoms, but the same element. They have the same amount of electronegativity, so therefore the electron cloud is, one would imagine, completely evenly distributed around the molecule. Now, you would therefore say that this molecule is nonpolar, and that's actually, that's absolutely true. It is nonpolar, but there is a little bit of stickiness that goes on between molecules, and it's due to the fact that this electron cloud around here moves around at random. It's like these electrons are kind of swarming around here, and at some point you can get the situation where, let me just draw another one, some point you can get the situation where just at random you might get a, a bulge of the electron cloud like that. Now that does happen. In that sense, just for a little while, it's temporary, but just for a little while, this molecule has a dipole on it, not that dissimilar to the permanent dipoles you see with things like water molecules. So I could, in fact, just for a little while, write delta minus here because obviously the negative electron clouds out here and delta plus here like that. You might think well so what? Um, what's it going to, how's that going to affect an adjacent nitrogen molecule? Well it affects it of course because this negative cloud of electrons here will actually push electrons in this molecule away from it, cause it to bulge out down in this direction like this. So if I was to write something here, I could write this as delta minus delta plus. So I think you can see what's happening here now. You've actually got, for a little while at least, an attractive charge between these two molecules. I could draw it in again with these strokes like this showing there's an attractive charge between them. Now that's called a van der Waals force. You might expect that uh, this particular force is relatively weak, and indeed it is, much, much weaker than, say, a hydrogen bond, and certainly much, much weaker than ionic bonds or covalent bonds, but they do occur. And this means that um, some molecules end up um, being... Uh, actually uh, solids at room temperature just by way of these van der Waals forces. Certainly doesn't happen for nitrogen, it's a gas at room temperature. But the important thing to realise with all of this is that the bigger the molecule, the greater the van der Waals forces of attraction between them. And the reason, of course, is pretty simple. If I drew this as a big long molecule and I had one adjacent to it like this, this whole thing is all like a big swirly mass of electrons here and here, like this. And you could imagine at any point you get a, a bulge out in this direction, causes a bit of a shrinkage in this direction, and you get a van der Waals force here. You might get another one here, etc, etc. So the bigger the molecule is, the greater the van der Waals forces between them. So, to give you an example of how this works, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, some fatty substances that occur in butter, they are in fact just big long molecules of carbon and hydrogen, and they're joined together by van der Waals forces. The molecules are essentially nonpolar, and um, as you know, at least a reasonable temperature butter remains as as a solid. Um, the other thing you should take into account then is that this would explain why butter is slippery because the van der Waals forces can break and form and so therefore butter has a sort of slippery feel to it. Things like waxes, by the way, like candle wax, which is much more solid than butter, just consists of even bigger hydrocarbon molecules, molecules of carbon and hydrogen, and therefore the um, melting point for those waxes is higher and they're more solid at room temperature. Okay, let's just move on here. That's just a little summary for you.
and I've already talked about these van der Waals forces and these temporary dipoles. So by the way, one little bit of terminology that you should pick up with this is that the forces between these molecules are intermolecular. That's what that prefix means. It means between those molecules, not in the molecules themselves, which would be intramolecular. And again, just a little summary for you there. All right, just a little summary of the um, comparing these different forces that we've examined. We've got van der Waals forces, which tend to be the weakest ones of the lot. Uh, hydrogen bonds, which are somewhat stronger. And, uh, of course, then we get up into the area where we've got things with very st pretty strong bonds indeed, things like ionic and covalent bonds. I wouldn't necessarily rate covalent above ionic. They'd be more or less sitting about the same area. Okay, what does all this mean in practical terms? Well, I've already talked about the idea that something like butter is soft and slippery. Now you know why, because the molecules that uh, comprise butter are actually only joined together by these weak van der Waals forces. Interesting one here is that water can dissolve table salt. Table salt, as you know, is sodium chloride, Na plus Cl minus. Um, it's a very hard compound to melt. You have to use uh, some pretty extreme temperatures or up around nearly a thousand degrees to get the stuff to melt. That is to pull the ions apart and yet this stuff will in, uh, dissolve in water at room temperature. And the reason for that is because the sodium ions being positively charged can actually link up with the negatively, the delta negatively charged oxygen atoms in water and the uh, chloride ions can uh, link up with the uh, slightly positively charged hydrogens in water as well. I've already talked about the fact that water is pretty sticky and therefore it's actually a liquid at room temperature. Um, cell membranes are fluid. The cell membranes that bound cells are actually made out of hydrocarbon which is a um, I said before, it's a, it's a non-polar type compound um, or, or series of compounds. Um, they're insoluble in water because like dissolves like. Uh, they're non-polar, water's polar, so cell membranes are insoluble in water, but they're also, because they're joined together by these relatively weak uh, van der Waals forces, tend to be quite fluid, which is what you need, of course, because you need to be able to allow molecules in and out of cells and, and for cells themselves to be able to move. Here's an interesting one. Margarine is made by straightening bent molecules. If you think back to what I was telling you before about van der Waals forces and the bigger the molecules, the better they bind by van der Waals forces. The other thing is it also depends on how easy they stack together. If you've got nice long straight molecules, they stack together quite nicely and you can maximize your van der Waals forces. But if they're bent, they tend to be minimized. Uh, if you have a look at something like vegetable oil, it's actually made up of hydrocarbon that's got bent molecules. Uh, those bent molecules, because you've got carbon-carbon uh, double bonds, so you've got this sort of arrangement, like this, and that's what puts the bend in the molecule. You can get rid of that bend if you add hydrogen to it. So if you add hydrogen, you end up with carbon-carbon single bonds, and then those molecules tend to be straight. So these are bent, these are straight. So if you add hydrogen to these bent molecules, when they straighten out, they actually go from being a liquid at room temperature to a solid. And that's pretty much how you make margarine. Margarine is made by taking uh, liquid vegetable oils, that's what oils are, they're just a fat, a hydrocarbon at room temperature, adding hydrogen to them chemically, and you straighten the molecules out, they then become stickier because of those van der Waals forces and they turn into a solid that we call margarine. In fact, if you have a look on the side of a margarine container, it'll say something in the ingredients about hydrogenated vegetable fat or oil, and now you can see why. It's hydrogenated vegetable oil. Another interesting one's this one.